Parallel to these musical developments were the dances first pioneered by original b-boys in the early 70s, such as Phase 2 and the Nigger Twins, that later developed into the complex and acrobatic moves demonstrated by crews such as the Rockwell Association, the New York City Breakers, and the Rocksteady Crew. Although name writing goes back thousands of years to the times of the ancient Sumerians and the Romans, it has nothing to do with aerosol culture, and what modern writers do is not graffiti, despite what anybody calls it. Graffiti is for billboards and restrooms. Another misconception to be cleared up is that concerning the late Keith Herring. Herring was never a writer in the aerosol culture sense of the word. Yes, he did exhibitions and shows with writers, but so what? People will claim they know little or nothing about the culture, but at the same time will say they've heard of or seen the work of Keith Haring, thus admitting they know nothing. Not everyone that uses a spray can is a writer, just like not everyone that uses a paintbrush is an artist. Also, not all writers listen to rap music either, as their tastes in music and cultural influences are as rich and diverse as their painting styles. For instance, if aerosol culture had come over here in the 70s, writers would have been listening to the youth music of that era. In 1989, the London Transport Authorities extensively employed the media in savagely condemning aerosol writing, stating that they were finally curbing the graffiti menace. This was closely followed by sweeping dawn raids on certain writers and the publicising of these acts. Writers then retaliated with their own sweeping attacks on tube lines such as the Metropolitan and Circle to sometimes devastating effect. Since then, with irregular intervals, a cat and mouse game has been played out on London's underground system and despite their claims it is a game which London Underground are badly losing. With regards to authorities that say they're beating graffiti, it's, um, I know different, that's, that's the public face. In reality, they know they're losing. They've said to many of us writers, we can't win because we can never be everywhere at once. And they know, they know the determination as well is something they can't fight, really. The authorities can blame writers for the rising prices of transport fares and the constant delays, but could they explain the reasons for the growing popularity of aerosol culture? choose to remain silent and ignorant when cornered, they have enough photos of good quality pieces on trains and information to put together a three volume encyclopedia on the art form that would make subway art look like a brochure. And that's from London and the south of England alone. Yet they are never shown. So why the cover up? Most train writers that I know, it's like a thing of train writing is really, is really the hardcore. Back of anything, you'll have the hardcore and the root in its like most basic form. So people always look to that. And train writers, they feel that canvas and walls is something that's good, but you don't get the excitement and you don't get the same effect as a train. But for many who do legal stuff, their attitude is sometimes towards train writers, it's not very positive. They feel that train writers are holding them back. Then you've got some that go into canvas and sometimes the view, that view gets more extreme. They, they, they want to take it off walls and trains and just keep it on canvas. But, I mean, they can all really coexist. There's no reason why 
they shouldn't all exist. There's writers that do all three. All right, the thought has crossed my mind, yeah, if something should happen, yeah, I'll go along with it. But if it doesn't, there's no, no thing to me because that's not what I'm out here for. I'm out here to bomb, period. That's what I started for. I didn't, I didn't start writing to go to Paris. I didn't start writing to do canvases. I started writing to bomb, to destroy all lines. And that's what I'm doing. How long do you think you'll do it? Until I'm finished. With its imminent worldwide popularity amongst today's youth, in looking back on its growth and development, would it be fair to name names when charting its progress? I don't really think it's fair ever in any circumstances to name names. I mean, if you look at things like Subway Art, Star Wars and New York, from a lot of people that I know from over there, they're considered to be a pretty big misrepresentation of the truth of what happened in New York. Some of the people that are represented in them documentaries and books I represent on a very small scale and were the most important people within them scenes. Other people were made to look important but were virtual nobodies. And I think the same applies to London, although it's a smaller scene and I'm not trying to compare. But basically, if you, if you start naming people and giving them importance, you take away from everybody else. And I think everybody is involved. There's many people, many artists, um, I wouldn't like to name any names. I don't think anybody is important enough to really name. It's all been a, you know, conglomeration of different names and people throughout the years and London coming together to create what exists now. I don't think any one person can really claim to have given anything in particular more than a lot of other people. How do New York writers view the scene in London? How do New York writers see us? I don't think they do, to be quite honest. I don't think that we exist to them. Uh, one of my friends in New York once said to me that if graffiti, and yet again, for lack of a better word, whatever one of people want to call it, if, if a piece isn't on the side of a New York train, it isn't a piece. One of my friends in New York said that to me, and I can understand the mentality, I can understand what he's saying. It's like, you know, um, I don't know, if you take something else around the world that's culturally related to a certain place, and you try and transport it across the world and put it in the hands of other people and try and make it alive. Sometimes it's not going to be because it's not real, it's fake. And to them, I think to a large extent, that is how most of them think. As far as that city is concerned and most of the writers are concerned, no one else exists. The only people who give any credit to writers around the world is people who want to be seen as part of this international movement. They want to be down with, you know, sort of like the international photo swaps and send magazines all around the world and, you know, have people showing them credit. And also that they're scared that people are going to forget about them, that people are going to, you know, sort of box up New York or something that finished in... 1985 or whatever it came, forget that people are still there and they want their fame, you know, for, they want people to think about them. I think that's their main association with parts of Europe, really, is, um, or Australia or somewhere, okay, is just, you know, staying in contact, finding out what's happening in Europe, okay, just so that they can still be part of what is now a very large international scene and they can be seen to be leaders of that scene or whatever, which they are, you know, but I think. I don't think they're interested in what's happening in Europe. I don't think they look at the pieces and think, yeah, that's of any interest. Because they've seen the original pieces that most of that was copied from 10 to 15 years ago. You know, running on a dirty train through the South Bronx or Brooklyn. Loss of a close friend or loved one is never an easy situation to have to cope with, especially as in so many cases the loss comes quickly and without warning. Death is but the closing of one door and the opening of another a passport to another level of existence. If you can imagine the world we live in as a country, then the ones we say goodbye to are on another continent across the oceans of time, a place and dimension we cannot yet go to because our ticket has not yet come through, which will allow us passage through the said gateway. So, regardless of what writers in Europe or New York think or don't think of the scene in London and the rest of the country, the light at the end of the tunnel, beckoning us all to the other side, runs an ominous thread through the international aerosol community, like a ghost train awaiting its passengers to take them to their final destination before they have to change and go to the next platform. train caught his jacket, pulling him out of his hiding place and into the tunnel. Tonight, London Underground promised a full inquiry and said they're considering tightening up security at all their stations.
Like vultures around a wounded life form, transport authorities have tried to cash in on periodic departures by using the media to highlight the dangers of writing on subways and what they see as the inevitable outcome of those who choose not to heed their warnings. There have been well over a dozen deaths of writers in Britain, and although a few have not been writing-related, the scene has still been very much affected by their loss. Will you be out again in trains or on the street doing I mean, graffiti? I never was in trains. The mortality rate of writers in America is a lot higher and far more brutal, reflecting the growing public demand for vengeance as opposed to justice, which has declared it open season on aerosol writers. And just for thought, how long will it be before corporations vying to buy ad space on the outside of trains join in the fight against aerosol culture in order to protect their lucrative investment? Michelle Shocked, on her debut album Short Sharp Shocked, recorded a track about the brutal killing of Michael Stewart, a Nubian American writer who died whilst in police custody after being arrested for subway writing. And although the case was brought to court, none of the officers involved were found guilty or even suspended. And recently in San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, California, a self-styled vigilante, William A. Masters II, shot two Mexican-American writers, one of them in the back, killing him instantly, for writing their names beneath the Hollywood freeway overpass. Despite this brutal murder, the villain was treated like a hero by the press and public alike and became something of a celebrity via TV, radio, press and even appeared on talk shows. The deputy DA, Robert L. Cohen, decided no charges were to be made against Masters and to public adulation he walked free. The excellent American police series, NYPD Blue, also ran a similar story featuring the beating to death of a Puerto Rican writer by two men for apparently tagging a car. Isn't he? Isn't he dead? They say he's pretty badly hurt. Can you tell me what you saw? Um, there was two of them. The first guy came up with a baseball bat and he knocked him down and then he, he, he started hitting him and kicking him and stuff. And then another one, he came up in a car, jumped out and hit him and kicked him too. And that's when I went over there to the grocery. And he was yelling to them in Italian. Who's that? The grocer was. A popular myth perpetrated by sections of the establishment and believed by the public is that writers are also responsible for much of the crime on the underground. Of all of the experience I have with, with writers, I don't know any, any writers involved in muggings or any of that type of crime or, or theft or pickpocketing on, on, the, on the underground system or buses or anywhere else. Um, I, I think it's a nice, it, it's a crime in itself. And I, very few of them are into other crimes, so I, I wouldn't say that there's any link, any any links between sort of violent or or theft on on the underground or transport and graffiti. There is a perceived link, but I don't think it's there. I don't think.